So uh, the next event on our agenda is a keynote speak speech from Christoph Jurchak. Yeah? More or less. More or less. Um, so Christoph is the founder and managing partner at Quantination, a leading early stage venture capital firm dedicated to quantum technologies. Um, he also has some serious quantum bona fides, having done his PhD with Alain Aspe uh, at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. I definitely don't speak French. Um, so, <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, so please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. So there are some uh, poles around here. So my name is Jurczak in Polish, right? <laughs> Great stuff. So I will start with uh, an old picture actually to humble us a little bit and myself in particular. So I I'm there somewhere on the left, a guy with the weird uh, green shirt back in 1994 with uh, Aspe. Uh, who was then uh, leading my uh, well my uh, PhD advisor, and I put this slide because I use it. I used it actually back in 15, 2015, 2016, when I started exploring uh, quantum nation. So the concept of uh, of a fund dedicated to quantum technologies, and I still like it because I think it reminds me of a couple of things. First, we always definitely need great science to start with any project that we're investing in. And second, it takes a lot of time to get from the, the science to the startup. In that specific case, it was a company called Mucrance, French one, that was uh, developing a gravimeter uh, made of uh, neutral atoms. Um, as you've seen, it took them essentially 20 years to go from the lab to the proof of concept. Commercial in 15, not so much. I think it took five more years, actually, probably 2020, they started selling these devices, and now there's selling a couple, and the company has been, has been sold uh, actually to another one. But very important uh, in this kind of sector to remember uh, that things take time, uh, and we uh, as investors obviously want to make some money, but we need to keep that uh, in perspective, that's sure. Another one slide that I, uh, one big trigger for me when we started making our investments was, uh, actually it was mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, this, uh, hello world of quantum computing back in 16. So for people who were not there looking at, uh, uh, at uh, using a quantum computer by the time, I think it might come a little bit as a surprise not so long ago, 2016, seven years. So so many things have happened since 16 until you know, a little bit earlier of in this year when IBM declared the time for quantum uh, utility uh, was, was there. Well, something we can talk about. Uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later. But again, uh, it takes time, but it's also quite fascinating how fast it's going. I mean, from a couple of qubits to a full machine that's available, that's on the web, uh, that people can use uh, to run algorithms on. So we must acknowledge that things have been progressing in the end quite fast, but there's still much more to do, obviously. And the much more to do uh, is essentially uh, here talking about the fund, what we're doing ourselves. So we started building this fund and called Quantonation, which is based, uh, I'm based in Boston. Uh, most part of the team is in, is in France, actually in Paris. So we started investing back in 2018. I tend to say we catch the wave, the quantum, the quantum wave. And we made 27 investments, investments in 27 companies. Uh, the fund was more or less, is more or less $100 million. Uh, it's essentially over. Uh, from the perspective of uh, our investments. We're not investing in new companies anymore with these funds. Uh, we do only reinvestment in the companies that we have in the portfolio. Uh, one local company, MemQ, uh, Sean was in, in the panel a little bit earlier. And as you've seen, we invested in quantum computing, several platforms, neutral atoms, photonics, superconducting technologies, silicon, uh, neutral, well, photonics again, software, uh, quantum networks, um, I think it's been a big topic today. Uh, I know it's important for the ecosystem here, of course, but uh, beyond MemQ, we'd like to mention Wheelink, which is also developing uh, quantum memories, and QFOX, uh, that's uh, coming from the Netherlands. They build the connectors, the Ethernet cable, if you want, to connect uh, uh, superconducting processors uh, to photonic networks. Quantum sensing, uh, we have not talked too much about that today. A very important sector, a bit tricky. Um, if it comes to questions, my, uh, give my perspective on that, but still uh, very interesting. And the fourth segment that's uh, a part of our investment thesis, not quite quantum, uh, can be, for example, silicon photonics, photonic processors, or enabling technologies. Could be fridges, lasers, or, or things like that. And I've mentioned that the fund has been quite successful, so we've invested a large part of the capital we raised among LPs. 
um, you have to understand that these 100 million essentially turn into more or less 400 million investments with the in investors who are investing alongside us, and probably 200 or 300 more millions from, of public money. So total, well, the, the effect or the impact uh, of a vehicle like that is quite big, actually, in creating or contributing to the creation of an industry. And as a consequence, uh, yeah, this one is kind of at the end of its investment period. So we're starting and we're raising now a, a new fund called Quantonation 2. Uh, same thesis, uh, working on quantum technologies and deep physics for the three segments here, but a little bit bigger, 200 million, and also a bit more global. Here we were quite focused on Europe and North America. Uh, we will also make investments in Asia Pacific with the new fund, but still early stage because we believe uh, there's a, a need, a necessity to invest in the early stages. Of course, uh, there needs also uh, to happen a couple more things. I'll come to it a little bit later. Two examples I want to focus on uh, from this first fund. I mean, few lessons learned if you want. Uh, so this one uh, I'm quite proud of. It's, uh, that's the work that we investors do as well, connect portfolio companies, make them work together, collaborate. So two portfolio companies, Qubit Pharmaceuticals, computational drug design, largely running on GPUs, so classical processors. They're all quantum chemists. I mean, from Sorbonne University, WashU in the US, and uh, University of Texas uh, as well, and Pascal, neutral atoms quantum processor. So I, whoops, coming back. I am always, uh, I should say that, uh, I've been approached so many times by physicists telling me you need a quantum computer to simulate chemistry. No, you cannot imagine. Physicists don't necessarily know, I mean, but might come as a surprise, that you can indeed simulate uh, chemistry with pretty good algorithms. So these guys, very experts in that, they can simulate very big molecules, 100,000 atoms in its approximate up to a certain point, but it works actually. But the important thing in this kind of collaboration and what I've learned uh, along the way is that if you put the smart people who know exactly what they're talking about in terms of algorithms, benchmarks, what you have to beat in order for this specific application to have an impact in the industry, and the people developing the hardware, in that case uh, Pascal, Neutral Atoms Company, I think this will be very successful. In that specific case, we have worked on something that might seem like not yeah, not that much, but how to position water molecules in chemical reactions. That's super important, as Jean-Philippe says here, he's the CSO at Qubit Pharmaceuticals, a professor at Sorbonne University in France. And they have shown, for example, in this picture, uh, they've used the processor, Pascal processor, to position in blue water molecules in a pretty big protein. It's called the major urinary, uh, urinary protein one, MUP1, for example, and it works for a small number of qubits, will work better for a bigger number, but that's something that these people who are using GPUs all the time uh, to position these water molecules in reactions think as value. Of course, we'd prefer all to do a very nice uh, full quantum computation of a very large molecule. It's not gonna happen anytime soon, but this kind of application is very important and the community should look for this kind of collaboration. Benchmarking is key. You need to beat the best approaches and it works, it starts to work. The other example I want to give is not, strictly speaking, quantum, but that's something uh, I'm also very proud of. Uh, that's an application that's, uh, that's a, a startup called Sensorium. They're out of Nashville, uh, so Vanderbilt University, and they're using nanophotonics uh, for sensing. So we've started investing in a company about two years ago. And the example, uh, the reason why I want to show this is that maybe contrary to what Many, many people think about investors. I mean, in that specific case, and by large, well, in general, that's an approach I like, we like to give some freedom to the founders. In that specific case, we had this great technology uh, to develop uh, some, come back again, to develop this filter here uh, to use for sensing, so we're working with a couple of companies in, uh, to, in industrial gas uh, technologies, but they found out well, a little bit by chance, but they could use it also for radiative cooling, which is something quite miraculous to me, but I like very much. And they just announced today, actually, a big contract with TII Abu Dhabi on uh, how to use these more or less same classes of materials for radiative cooling towards water harvesting in the desert. Uh, obviously, an application of big impact. But that's not something we had bet on. That was not an application we had in mind at the beginning. And long term, we have another play in view 
using uh, nanophotonics for light sources, detectors, modulators, might take a while, but we like that kind of approach, a platform that you can use with a very clear first application, some revenues, ideally, but then people have to have imagination. That's what we're looking for also in startups. Think big, uh, bring your ideas, we can discuss that, and, and I think that's very important. When investors for this kind of deep tech are too, are too narrow-minded, I think that's a limitation to what the companies can build and can become. And I wanted on this slide just to mention, uh, actually, well, I was talking about impact here. Uh, there was a very nice workshop uh, NSF funded a couple of weeks ago, uh, AGE Research in Schenectady on quantum for climate and sustainability. And no greenwashing was really a good uh, workshop. Good use cases were discussed. And we came to a very interesting conclusion. It's going to be published somewhere. But I think it's important for the whole community to work also on these kind of applications, uh, impact oriented. So now, I mm -hmm. mean, investors, I'm going to put some numbers uh, and tell you a little bit what's going on in, uh, in, uh, in venture capital for, for quantum. Things are not so bad, uh, I would say, in general, especially for early stage funding. Um, as you know, uh, venture capital in general is down uh, quarter on quarter if you compare with last year. Uh, for quantum, we have seen in 21, 22, pretty spectacular growth, uh, venture capital investment, about 2 billion per year. We anticipate should be a little bit more than 1.5 billion this year. So down, but even in AI, you see uh, about 40% quarter on quarter a reduction in investment this year with respect to last year. I mention AI because uh, you might think it's big, two, mil two billion, actually it's very small. AI is 10 billion per quarter, so or like 50 billion per year, up to 100 billion. So with quantum, there's still a long way to go. Uh, if anything, we need more money. I mean, like some people tell me sometimes, quantum winter this, uh, overeating that, et cetera, so it depends on the perspective. But I say we don't have enough money. I mean, we need more investors, uh, venture capitalists, in particular, in particular for later stages, when the companies are growing and need more capital. A couple hundred millions, Series B, Series C, uh, that's definitely where we need more investment, uh, and hopefully this will happen. Uh, we had a question a little bit earlier about government. Uh, well, one thing that governments are doing worldwide is funding quantum technologies, and the number are pretty significant, as you see. There are national plans everywhere, like uh, funding startups, funding research. Uh, there needs to be a balance. Remember what I said earlier, we need groundbreaking science to have uh, exceptional startups, obviously. So we're pushing as well ourselves for more investments uh, in, uh, in fundamental science, and of course also some public support for the startups, but it's happening, and I'm gonna give a couple of examples. Two things uh, I want to mention here. Uh, the first one is public is one thing, but there's also private investment, and it's not nearly big enough at this stage, especially large corporates. I think we need them to be more involved. Um, so uh, showing here some data, uh, but you don't necessarily see often, uh, especially when you look at how the the governments are ranked. And when you put uh, industry funding, especially in the US, definitely there's a huge lead uh, when, you add, uh, when you add public and, and private funding with respect to uh, EU and, and China. These data are coming from, uh, from this book, by the way, which is uh, done by a French uh, uh, researcher, uh, consultant, which is pretty good, quite a lot of data. It's way too big, uh, 1,800 pages, uh, hard to read, but if you know what you're looking for, I think it's a good one. Uh, it's a good reference for, for many things. And the second thing I wanted to mention is this one, which is more of a concern to us. Uh, this is also coming from the same book. It's the rate of creation of startups in quantum. And it's not good, obviously. It doesn't look, uh, yeah, it doesn't look sustainable. There was a peak in the startup creation back in 17, 18. I, well, even a bit earlier for some, like IonQ, Rigetti, et cetera. Uh, France, we had Pascal, then Alice and Bob, Candela, uh, so. We see these companies here. Um, for some reason, uh, that, well, that's something that doesn't work well here. I mean, definitely tech transfer is not happening as it should. I mean, there's a lot of science that we think could be transferred and transformed and lead to the creation of startups, but definitely there's something that's not working really well. And I have a, a couple of ideas, obviously, about how to make things better. And that would be the, the last part of my presentation. So this one is a typical consulting slide with lots of arrows and, uh, and boxes, BCG, uh, just to show that things are messy, of course, uh, but startups are not born, born out of nothing. I mean, they're born in ecosystems, and yeah, Chicago is a great ecosystem. Uh, we've been, I think, I've been 
interacting with Chicago probably since 2018 or 2019 uh, already, since we began, uh, more or less. So we know some parts of the ecosystem here. There are some other places in the world as well. Uh, but all these people, all these uh, entities here, they need to interact. They need to find a place to talk to each other. Uh, they need uh, to share information. And sometimes, and that's particularly true, there's anything I can say here a little bit about Europe as well, it's not so well understood in, in some countries that this is important. I mean, it's not just funding a couple of startups that matters. It's also funding, uh, yeah, something to put some glue into the ecosystem for, for people to talk, to connect, and to work together. It's been mentioned a little bit earlier, but there are some good examples how to do it. And uh, first, uh, one thing uh, I want to mention, uh, here in Chicago, that's a pretty nice example, a hackathon that happened a couple of months ago. Uh, by a collaboration with a, a not-for-profit, which I am a co-founder of, called Quantix. Uh, it's a French one. Uh, but we've worked with uh, Chicago Quantum Exchange here. It was a great event, a couple of, yeah, two months ago. No, two months ago, I think, uh, something like that. It was in September, I think. And what was really great is to see that the use cases that have been brought to the hackathon were brought actually by industry, uh, like uh, big industry players. Uh, so. Uh, the teams here were working on some real-life industry use case. That's a good example of how to bring some people who don't know much about quantum, who try just to explore what to do in the sector to get in. Of course, it starts with Hackathon, then there are many, many things to do, but that's a good starting point. And Mark Safman gave also a very nice uh, presentation. I like very much the slide behind, behind. I think that's Kate who put the slide right. How, how long do we have to wait until uh, Quantum Advantage? But I think he was a good one. Quantum utility, sorry. And the last one I want to mention is, a, well, not a competing ecosystem, but I hope one that's going to collaborate with Chicago, but where we have quite a lot of activities since 2018. Uh, so it might be a surprise, but we, at Quantum Nation, will really see our work, a job as, yeah, building these connections between people as well. At the end of the day, I want more companies to be funded, created, and to invest in them, good companies to invest in. And one way to do it is what these guys are doing here. So we've started a quantum venture studio. Uh, it's going to start in January, actually, this year. Uh, it's funded by the, the Quebec government uh, in Canada uh, with two funds, Quantum Nation and, on, and another uh, local fund that's called Quantasset, dedicated to quantum technologies as well. Um, the studio is opening. They have a, a general manager, uh, Sarah, here. Uh, and we're going to have a big event actually next week. Uh, unluckily, it's exactly on Thanksgiving. So for Americans, we made sure nobody could come. <laughs> not by design, but it happened. We realized in the end, yeah, it's Thanksgiving. Okay, uh, but uh, yeah, not much control. Alain Aspect actually is, going, is, is coming to give a, a talk. It's going to be a, a super nice week in, in Sherbrooke. We'll have a couple of events. But the thing I really like about this, well, that's the studio, but it's not built out of nothing, just like that. It's built on a shared infrastructure, uh, which is called, well, in French, Espace Quantique uh, 1. Pretty large uh, space, uh, new building for refurbish, uh, refurbished building. Uh, one thing that is very attractive for anybody around the world is access to fridges, cryo, uh, cryo infrastructure. There are five fridges they bought, and they're going to rent it as a service, like pay well, for the time you need on the fridge for a startup, for a group uh, to get started and do some, yeah, do the, use it to, uh, for the duration you need. I think that's a great uh, idea, actually, and that's something that should be replicated elsewhere with uh, fridges, lasers, other kinds of equipments, not necessarily on university ground. I think it's best, in my view, if it's a little bit outside, managed differently. It's a not-for-profit that is managing the whole facility here outside of the University of Sherbrooke. Uh, so it has its autonomy, and I think it's working really well. So there's going to be quite a number of startups. Pascal is opening their uh, North American manufacturing site for neutral atoms processors there. Uh, Qubit Pharmaceuticals is working well there. North Quantic is a, a local company that's doing uh, superconducting qubits. Uh, but I think it's a great ecosystem uh, for us, at least a little bit of a model uh, that we use uh, when we are traveling around the world and, and sharing the, our vision about quantum technologies. And of course, we hope that uh, with Chicago, we've had some connections over time, but that will be uh, I think that's fantastic, but with what you're building here with this, uh, with this call, we've been following that. Uh, we need this kind of approach. I think that's very forward-looking, and uh, we essentially hope that there will be good success with this approach here in Chicago, uh, so that you will go on being 
one of the leading ecosystems for quantum in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. So my question is, how has the bear market affected the VC investment into quantum startups? Um, I think for it has the beginning of the year has been really slow for closings. Uh, like there were a couple of startups, I think it was mentioned on the slide. Um, there were a few startups that had started fundraising by year end of 22, but were like thinking, okay, well, nice valuations, uh, well, this, <laughs> everything's great. But then it was a little bit uh, more complex all of a sudden. So investors were slower to respond, deals were not closing. So the beginning of the year has been tough. So we encourage our startups to. Uh, work on their own way to give themselves a little bit more space, more time as well. Uh, sometimes we put some uh, convertible loans uh, to get a little bit more cash as well. But frankly, starting in June, July, uh, things got really better. I think out of our portfolio, we have seven term sheets for uh, rounds uh, that are active at the moment, and none is a down round, which is, I think, pretty good in the current environment. So all with uh, valuations going up, and sometimes pretty significantly. So I think for, let's say, Series A, or late seed Series A, this kind of, of company, like four or five years old, three, four years old, I think the situation is quite good. Uh, we see new investors coming as well, even for lead investors uh, for term sheets. What's a bit more tricky, uh, I think Stephanie mentioned a little bit earlier that she had a big, nice round uh, announced a couple of days ago, 100 million. So we had more of that in the past. I think this year, this, is, this has been pretty rare. And I think, I hope, that by yeah beginning of next year, we see more of that, uh, Series B, C, because we need the capital for these companies to, to continue growing. That's where I think we're still not where we were uh, like a year and a half, two years ago. So you mentioned the role of government um, in investing a little bit, but I want to ask maybe a more specific question. What are the things that private investment investment can do that government can't, and vice versa, what are the things that government investment can do that private investment cannot? Yeah, I think we can, uh, can be quite flexible with the way we distribute the money. Uh, maybe investment in companies uh, can be very short notice. Uh, sometimes when uh, we need to structure around, uh, we have expectations in terms of, let's say, deliverables that we can discuss. We can be also quite flexible with that, with, uh, with the companies we invest in. So I would say, Time, the time to, to put the money on the table can be, uh, yeah, it's less bureaucratic uh, from this perspective. So I think that's, that's positive. And the, what is expected is, is quite different as well. But ideally for us, especially in the early stages, uh, there is a form of really deep collaboration between government and us. So usually, especially, in, let's say, some, uh, some dealers in mind in Europe, we're putting some uh, venture money for a pre-seed deal, really a incorporation. Like, I don't know, one million, two million, something like that. We can work to find two, three million of non-dilutive money, but it takes more time to structure, but still we need to think about. Uh, maybe it comes six months later, nine months later. But if it's in the plan, I think that's, that's very good. I mean, and we need that. I mean, like, it's really the combination of the, the private and public money at the beginning that's really key to get the first three, four years uh, of the company. Uh, then I think that things might be a bit different. Uh, of course, when you get to, into sales, into different cycles, uh, need to build stuff, sell stuff, uh, obviously generate some revenues at some point. And, and many of our portfolio companies actually are generating revenues. Some people think there is no, is, is all pre-revenue, but I mean, many of them, uh, including quantum computing, including in software and hardware, are generating uh, significant revenues already. Uh, so that's something we, that has to be accounted for. But it's really a combination of both. I think it's, uh, it's nice uh, to work this way. So what can be done to reduce the adoption time from like large companies to bring out new quantum technologies? Like a hackathon is nice, but what you know, can be done to deepen that? Yeah, I think uh, it was mentioned in the panel a little bit earlier, and I tend to agree with that. I think people have to be clear about, especially in the case of quantum computing, for, for sense, well, maybe I'll start with sensing. For example, in sensing, what we had seen over the years is it was really hard to fund sensing, surprisingly enough, uh, I mean, for venture capital, because the dynamic was not that exciting in a sense, but not very fast, relatively slow moving. But we see now, 
a good appetite for quantum sensing, actually, people are realizing the value of the technology when it's compared to alternatives. Uh, and I think we have there, for me, the quantum advantage in, in sensing for many applications is there, uh, and it's not so much a question anymore. For quantum computing, uh, I'd say the big question is, I think people should really focus on use case and application where there's a chance of something happening. Like, and I've seen too many use cases, uh, hardware company or software company work on, where it was rather clear from the start, the complexity was too big, the benchmark was too hard to beat, uh, and there was not enough understanding of how challenging actually this use case was. Uh, I think it's better to focus on maybe things that look a little bit less exciting, but have a real impact, like this <laughs> question about uh, water molecules, for example. Actually, it's a big deal, but that's not necessarily what we had in mind when we started. Uh, but if 10% of a big work, computational workflow is dedicated to quantum, and the rest, 90% to GPUs, I think that's gonna be a huge success. Uh, but you need to work really hard on understanding where's the value in these workflows, and what quantum can really bring, instead of going to uh, a customer and say, okay, quantum is gonna change the world, I mean, like, yeah, not going to happen exactly like that from one day to the other. Uh, but that's this part, I think, of the uh, reflection that's sometimes overlooked. Uh, companies learn about that, but they should do a better job at, at that, I think. And that's going to be easier to bring in industry customers uh, with this perspective. Uh, a question from our virtual audience. Uh, do you have a sense for the ratio of funding between hardware and software-centric projects in quantum? The ratio in sense of how many my uh, portfolio or software hardware. Well, in general, I'd say, well, so far it's fair to say that until now most of the funding has gone to hardware, uh, just to build the platforms. I mean, it can be full stack uh, quantum computing companies uh, that are also developing some software, uh, including middleware or well, either application or middleware. Uh, but lots of the value. Lots of the money uh, so far has gone into hardware. I mean, few software play, uh, significant for some of them, but I think it will rebalance over time. Uh, so now that we will have a couple platforms in a thousand qubits range, uh, more applications should be developed, in my view, for these platforms over the next couple of years. So we need more application-oriented companies, provided they know their market well, I mean, like they know uh, what they have to beat. And I think in this condition, I think we, we should see much more uh, software companies, application-oriented companies. Hi, thank you. Uh, how was the district, the, the co-working space, how was that funded? Was that public and private? Uh, no, it's been mostly public, actually. So I think it's gonna be announced probably next, next Friday. Uh, I think the government wants to, or Quebec wanted to put something together. Uh, so it's been largely public uh, and uh, part of the studio as well. So it's really, but then of course the companies that are joining are gonna pay for the service. So it's a well, public private, let's say, uh, model, but the initial impulse uh, was really from the ecosystem for, or from the regional government, provincial government, uh, to get that ecosystem started. Let's thank Christoph again. Thank you.